In the spring of 1999, the center of the universe was London, England. Back then, many of today's lamest things were still edgy, glammed up, adventurous. Rock stars, spies, study abroad. Cool Britannia was real, and it was beautiful. In Piccadilly Circus, I wandered through a music shoot the day before, spotting the band on the cover of their new hit single release, Barbie Girl, yes. And for every fizzy blast of meaningless fun, there was a cloaked and alluring underside. Difficult guitar bands kept releasing difficult records about secret agents and hotel betrayals, and people kept buying those records. It was peak jet set, peak highbrow, peak hype, peak celebrity. The world of J.G. Ballard, Salman Rushdie, Elton, Seal, Bono. It was war studies by day, ministry of sound by night, brunch in Bjork's neighborhood, dinner in Madonna's. I rode the tube to underground clubs, handing change to refugees whose missing limbs were lost somewhere, maybe just days ago, in the former Yugoslavia. Terrorism was nibbling its way into the collective consciousness, but everyone's vision of the future was still Heathrow Airport. Massive, blank, gleaming. A canvas, a portal, an invitation to infinity. I peered over the edge of that great white abyss in 1999, and then I went home to the States and watched the West slow walk itself through the shiny, beckoning doorway. As we now all know, what was on the other side was less than advertised. The long, hard come down in America looks like a 1999 style party compared to the rest of the so called Anglosphere, with the British leading the charge into dystopian oblivion. Today, the UK is a proving ground for the post Christian, post constitutional Borg state being readied for us Yanks from lockdown governance and retroactive censorship to punitive online surveillance and the three Harrys of the apocalypse Styles, Windsor, Potter. Is it too late to learn the harsh lessons? visited on our cousins across the pond? Is it too late to make the transatlantic music industry great again? How can one person answer both questions? The answer lies in the hands of Winston Marshall. La 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 la. This is Zero Hour. We are with Winston Marshall. He is a British musician and podcaster, best known as the former banjoist and guitarist of the folk rock band Mumford and Sons. He's won multiple awards, including a Grammy and two Brits. He's now the host of the Marshall Matters podcast and the co founder of Hong Kong Link Up. Welcome, Winston. How are you? James, thank you for having me. It's great to be back in Texas and back on Blaze TV. Absolutely. Can I challenge your opening monologue? Please. Aqua. Yes. Is that, is that the zenith of Western culture, and the, the zenith of 90s music? Well, that was sort of the effervescent bubble at the, at the end, right? You had, you had them, you had uh, uh, Robbie Williams, you had like Eiffel 65, you know, you all these sort of like <laughs> extremely... <laughs> what was the Eiffel 65 song? Blue. Yes. I'm blue, but I'm blue, but I'm But I'm blue. We are still like, what? you know, these, these songs are still in... I mean, Robbie Williams, maybe not so much, but a lot of these no, songs... Hang on, no. Still Robbie's still, still got it. Robbie is still touring. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie had great songs. Angel is indisputably a, a phenomenal song. But Eiffel 65, Aqua. Yeah, it was <laughs> all going on. on. Spice Girls. I mean, you yeah. know, Ginger was a, was a UN ambassador. <laughs> okay, but Spice Girls, they're, they had they're great songs. But the songs like Barbie Girl and I'm Blue Ba Da Ba 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 come on. Let's, let's separate the, the wheat from the I chat. mean, if you would like to separate Robbie Williams and the Spice Girls from the one-hit wonders of the, of the late 90s, then I suppose you could do it, but I don't know, man. I think it was all, it was all of a piece, and, uh, and there was this undercurrent of like darkness and weirdness that was creeping in. You know, you could see, you could see Aqua wandering around in their platform heels doing the like psycho ABBA thing. I mean, that, that, did, that did ABBA record was charting for like, like 200 weeks or something. Did, like th those, though, that kind of song, uh, songs, uh, sort of an indicator for the kind of synthetic culture, the plastic culture of the 90s. And I, I think an indicator of a, a kind of vapid, the vapid and, and vacuous side of the 1990s. Well, sure, yeah, I mean, it was very, it was very vacuous, but there was also, you know, I mean, uh, you, you can go through the, the Oasis catalog and we can argue about sort of Oasis songs, but there was a heart to a lot of those songs and there was this kind of poignancy. Hang on, okay. 
Oasis, Blur, that we can't put them in the same category as Eiffel 65. No, 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 no. not musically <laughs> in the same category, but the, it was these categories or were very... Or in any category, <laughs> they were great. And Eiffel the 65 The categories was were, not good. were very, I mean, the cultural categories. And so there was like this very synthetic, this sort of cheese thing going on. And then there was like this very like self-referential kind of like, you know, what, what used to be indie rock and was converted into this kind of corporate rock. Um, and then you had, you know, the girls. I mean, it was Kylie Minogue. It was, there was this really fluid crossover between very self-conscious pop and sort of more introspective, like, rock. And I don't mm. know. I thought it was um, it was a very powerful time. It was a very brief time. You come out of the, the early 90s and in the mid-90s, and it was all very depressing, very gloomy, and uh -huh. very flannel, and very indie. And then, you know, the, the industry worked in the sense that you know they identified the talents, they started handing them lots of money. Music videos became like a really big thing, like million dollars a video, very glossy, very shiny. Um, it happened to the Verves, it, ha it happened to Smashing Pumpkins, it happened to a lot of bands that you know were very, very lo-fi, very indie to start out. And then they became big, big hits, big stars, very glossy, um, and uh, and it was a, it was a it was a brief it was a brief moment. I mean, you go from that to like 2000 2001, and and what did you have? You had Papa Roach, Papa disturbed, Roach, Limp Bizkit, Limp Bizkit, Corn. <laughs> you know, I was born, and I, I that was more in my generation. Significant other Limp Bizkit was, where I mean, and they're still going. Fred Durst is still still at it. I yes, think. I am. I, I I don't think I'm doxing Fred, but I understand that he recently moved uh, out of L.A. Uh -huh. um, as as everyone does these days, we can talk about that too. Um, to uh, well, I guess I'll just say like a very a bucolic smaller town somewhere in the interior of. He's California. gone trad. Uh, I <laughs> he's gonna have to like. Did he lose the soul patch? I think he probably did. Is he gonna now. do sort of a, a bluegrass album, mountain music, um, um, soul? I, I don't know. But I mean, did, did growing acoustic. up in that sort of milieu like is, was that something that made you say like you know what like banjo? I'm gonna do that. Kind of, actually. I, I, I mean, those bands and Blink-182 also comes to mind. I love Blink-182 and there were great songs, great harmonies. And, and then I think it was like 99, 2000, around that period that A Brother Were Out There came out. And the soundtrack for that record, which T-Bone Burnett produced, it was every genre of classic American uh, mountain music, bluegrass, blues, country and every song was beautiful every single was beautiful. all the playing was astonishing and that for me was an introduction to folk instruments rootsy music and, and of the american variety and our version is different um and but like in the great tradition we hear your music we steal it we repackage it and sell it back to you um but when i heard that stuff i was i went out and bought a banjo i i, I, I thought it was amazing i'd never actually heard a banjo before then um and there was a record by Alison Krauss and um, Union Station called New Favorite, and that, that record as well, it was really high production, uh, bluegrass music. And that came from another world. That didn't make sense to me. That, that probably made as much sense to me as, as Eiffel 65 did to a cowboy in Texas. Yeah. It was just alien, and, um, and I loved that. Um, so, so that kind of took me on a, on a little journey. And I, and I think actually, I don't know if this is sort of over intellectualizing the period, but the, I, I came up in the kind of uh, folky uh, movement that started at the end of the noughties, like 2007, 8, 9, 10. And I, and I wonder if it's a coincidence that it happened just after the 2008 crash, because I think that maybe there was a movement away from the synthetic towards something more organic and real and not just the music being organic and real, but a sense of community, a sense of home, I think. I, I, maybe I'm over-intellectualizing it, but it seemed to me that the reason why in the early 10s there was a big boom of that style of rootsy music was a reaction to the aforescribed synthetic 20 years of, of that kind of uh, pop music. Yeah, well, it's interesting because, you know, in the New York scene, there was a reaction to that kind of stuff around the mid 2000s. But it was, you know, it was Interpol. I mean, the Killers had become a sort of international band by that point in time anyway. Um, it was, uh, it was moodier. It was more down tempo. It was more discordant, more, you know, sort of angular. Um, and all of that seems to have been just totally disinteresting.
No, I love that stuff. I mean, I love everything. You know, you didn't you didn't want to be like the next like Brandon Flowers or whatever. You didn't want to be like the well, guy. Well, no, I, I mean, I was in a rock and roll band called Gobbler's Knob, named after um, the, it's a great name uh, from Groundhog Day yeah. and the Bill Murray film. And we were doing ZZ Top covers and Audio Slave covers, and ro it was a rock and roll band. And uh, I, I would have loved to have been, been in the Killers. I think they're a great band. It, my life's a bit of an accident, and and. and it's, it's still to this day, everything I do, you mentioned my podcast uh, and uh, some of the Hong Kong work I've done, it, it, it's all very unpredictable to me, like where it's going, but I just pursue it. And, and me ending up being a banjo player in, in a successful band was, you don't, you, certainly in the, that period, if you want to be a rock star, you don't pick up a banjo. That's, it was, it was, it was because we loved it or because I loved it that I mm. pursued it. Um, uh, I, I, but I equally would have loved to have been in the in the Killers or one of those rock and roll bands. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely Killers respecter. Uh, in uh, in around the time when the Killers started to break, I basically looked like that in L.A. So like the armband and like the flat hair and the, the guy liner and the whole thing. It was a very a very magical moment. Yes, very magical indeed. You've been uh, on quite a journey. Oh yeah, finally got around to meeting Brandon. Um, gosh, I don't know. Uh, at, at whenever they played Gov Ball, I think it was I don't know, yeah. five years, four years ago or something. Um, and like a total, you know, total sweetheart, totally nice guy. Uh -huh. We sort of like compared chest hair and like laughed, had a laugh about that. It was a very wet, rainy. It was sort of gross, but that's quite an intimate relationship. It was, James. yes, it was very, uh, perhaps prematurely intimate, um, but but brief, nevertheless. Mm. Um, I, as a, a, a fellow, um, I don't know what the word is for someone who's willing to, you know, go down two buttons in, in the French style. Oh, I see. Yes. Deep V. Um, yeah, the deep V. I like that. That's that's a touch of class. Um, and uh, and he always seemed like the kind of guy too who was just sort of like didn't really plan it out that way and it happened that way and he managed to just like ride it and remain who he was um, and uh, you know I, I don't know if you sort of reflect on how your journey has sort of compared to whoever else was like rising at the time um, but it must have been a ride for yeah you, to say the least Absolutely, it remains, it remains a ride. It remains um, a ride. Uh, it sounds like you've been on a real ride. Um, yeah, well, you know, we all, we all take our, our various rides. Um, how, did it feel like it was happening, like, too fast for you, or did you like how Well, fast? you know, on the inside of it, or, or being on the inside, with, with the band, it didn't actually feel crazy quick because we, we were working incredibly hard, touring incredibly hard. It started with playing small pubs in London to our friends and then... Uh, playing slightly fuller pubs around the city. And then we started playing outside of London to um, pubs and venues around the country. And it just grew, each tour we did was ever so slightly bigger and it happened very gradually. And we learned how to entertain a uh, small room, then a, a, a theater. And then we started leaving the country playing in, in Germany and, and everything just very gradually grew, um, although Maybe that was something we took for granted. We were so young. I was a teenager when we started the band. We, we didn't appreciate, actually, it was pretty fast compared to our other, other bands. And even the fact that it was a gradual growth and we were in arenas within a few years is actually pretty astonishing looking back and, and um, somewhat miraculous. And I actually do think there was... Uh, uh, everyone wants to be in a rock and roll band. And even if you make a great record, the stars have got to align for you for it to... I know so much, so much talent um, that deserves to be playing, you know, headlining Bonnaroo or, or, or ACL, whatever. It is. And, and for whatever reason, it hasn't quite worked out. And uh, the COVID pandemic, that crushed a bunch of other artists yeah. that were ready to go with great records. And, and then by the time it's over, it's two years later, and there's a new 18-year-old superstar ready to take the place. And it, it's a very volatile industry, the music industry. And... It's, you know, it's dependent on, on so many things and it's completely unpredictable, I think. It is, and technology seems to be pushing people in a direction kind of away from, like, composition, melody, structure, albums. I mean, you know, this is something that's been brewing for a long time, but do you think that it's going to come back in any way? I mean, there was the COVID hit, um, but now it's, like, trending sounds on TikTok, you know, mm. it's, and some of those sounds are, you know, some of those sounds are great or whatever, and that, that can be a way of of doing music discovery, but you know, artists are still complaining about Spotify, like not giving them the foundation for like a real career, like a, a career that they can live off of. And, um, and there's you... the advent of AI is affecting yeah. a lot of it. I, I, I th it's amazing to have seen in 20 years, you know, when, when I started, it was all about f 
writing songs and forming bands. Mm -hmm. And now, and then, and then it became that you have these talents who do everything on their laptop. They write the songs, they've got incredible voices, and they can play all the, the instruments just by tapping away on on the keys and that's that's a talent that that's not to be no snuffed question. at like that's yeah. impressive and there's some kids who can do everything and i'm just in in awe of them and then how the music gets out to the world like you mentioned tiktok a and r now they don't go to pubs to find out new artists they see who who's trending on on tiktok who's blowing up and that's how they get they sign artists now now whether there'll be a uh, uh, and I think there's often reactionary movements to this kind of stuff. So if we, we get stuck in this world where that's the kind of artist that evolves and it's increasingly electronic or whatever, there might be a pushback where bands, there'll be a desire for, for that chemistry you get when three, four, five people are on stage playing off each other. That, that there's a magic there that, 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 that can never be snuffed out, that, that that will always be there. And whether it, I think it will come back into popularity. And when that is, obviously I, can, I couldn't say, but I think it will. Do you feel like there's a bit of a, a disconnect between what people want out of music right now and what is out there that they're getting? I have no idea what people want in music right now. I'm completely out of touch. Uh, um, and I mean, I, I, ever since the pandemic, I've put my head down and, and listened almost exclusively to Italian opera. I don't know what happened, but it was all so stressful that I just need something calming uh, at home. And uh, I, I, what are what are people listening to right now? Well, this what, is what's I mean, the this charts? Is, there there used to be like a much more sort of like mainstream audience, like a general audience, and I think this is true for books and true for fashion and true for music and you know other other things, films. Um, and now we have all these micro audiences and there doesn't seem to be, you know, there isn't a kind of like monolithic popular culture in the way that there was before. So, you know, maybe some openings, but I, I don't know. I think a lot of people are sort of looking looking for cues and maybe not, not getting those cues. One, one of the things I, um, again, maybe I'm overthinking it, but I, I, I see some artists and I think Billie Eilish might be one of those where it's almost like she's post internet. It's, it's an artist that couldn't be who she is if it had not been for the internet. It's an amalgamation of so many different influences, but not even closely related influences. There's, there's, um, she's part sort of Avril Lavigne and goth, and she's also got the sort of 1930s ukulele uh, singer, or maybe it's more of a 50, 60 thing, but, uh, and she's got pop sensibilities. She's got death metal sensibilities. There's a touch of classical in there. It's such a, a mix of, of things. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's the, 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 the generation of kids who are brought up on playlists where it's one song is electronic, then the next song is, is classical, then it's a techno song, then it's a hip hop song, then it's a blues song. And it's, and it's the, the genre thing. You know, in the 60s, you were in a gang and, you, and your gang was affiliated with a type of music. If you were a mod or a rocker or a punk, later and, and you listen to a type of music now everyone listens to everything and that's yeah amazing. that was your identity you know exactly if you, if you were a punk you were a punk and that was serious serious business i mean mm. people you know joe strummer was just like this you know it wasn't just about the music it wasn't just about the instrument it was like a person taking a certain kind of stand about who they were in the world and using the music to do that and it just you know i don't know does it get harder when when things like spotify are geared toward rewarding the most popular and best-selling artists of all time. And so if you're like coming in as like a new artist, you know, you're not competing against fellow new artists. You're competing against, you know, Elvis and the Beatles and, and ABBA or whoever. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Everything is at your fingertips. And it's, I would hate to be an up and coming uh, artist right now. I, I, I wouldn't, it, it, it's an impossible, um, it's even harder than when, when we started. I, I, I don't quite know how uh, they do it. Although, selfishly, I love that I can listen to all of that stuff. Although, I also say, I've got a 78 collection. And what I love about 78 is that a lot of that music isn't on Spotify. It's not on the internet. So when you listen to these songs, you really feel like you're the only person who has access to that music. And, and it's, I've got weird stuff from... Russian talk, spoken word to French waltzing and 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 it, it's it's almost like a, my own little rebellion against the streaming uh, world. But but that's a sort of perhaps a weird kind of a 
Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, I, think, I mean, I think people want to experience this. You know, there's a, there's a 78 record of, uh, of a song called Zero Hour from, from, I don't know, the 50s or something. Gonna have to have producers track it down, find, find the song. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a mess. Um, the, it's, I don't think people have given it to despair yet, but just let me tell you, like living in LA, you know, the city is not getting cooler. It's not getting more glamorous. It's not getting more fun. Um, and it's not just the homelessness. It's not just the, you know, fentanyl. It's not just the, the like, they're trying to increase the density and put, you know, it's just like micro apartments growing up everywhere, changing the character of the city, making it more generic. People are leaving. Um, I don't know, where do you spend most of your time? Like, where, where, where do you go that feels like, you know, a, Why do you think people a are leaving place LA? to be? I think it's getting more expensive. I think it's getting less unique. I think um, <laughs> the vibe is off. Uh, Hollywood is a mess. Um, you know, you got the, the writer's How is strike. Hollywood? How's Hollywood a mess? Yeah, well, you got the writer's strike because of AI. You know, they're trying to go from like the writer's room to the mini room. And basically the, the studios want to accelerate and compress the timetable for doing like, you know, TV series, like the ideal prestige TV series. You know, how do you get from concept to execution as fast as you can? And how can you do it for as cheap as possible? And so what they want to do is they want to put, you know, a smaller number of people in the room and instead of having them just kind of like spitball and like do drafts and everything and like let the thing breathe and let it be art, they want to just speed it up. They want to know how the entire series goes from beginning to end before they green light it. And they want to be able to quickly make these decisions about whether something will live or die and then put it into a faster production process. Um, and then, you know, the writers are like, well, okay, we see where this is going. They want to kind of make us a little bit more robot-like and have the refuer of us. And then how's that going to work when you can just take, you know, a day's work and feed it into the chat GPT and it spits out, you know, a lot of these shows are procedurals. It's really not rocket science. Um, and then it spits out, uh, you know, the work product of something that it, it would cost a lot of, you know, people, successful writers in Hollywood can make a lot of money. And they're starting to wonder if that's still going to happen. So that's just one wedge of it. I mean, you, what you said about the pandemic killing the, the music scene, you know, clubs in LA have closed down. They're not going to reopen. Um, there are like, you know, different sort of cultural factors going on. Um, there was a lot of pressure during sort of the pandemic BLM era for everyone to just like signal their conformity to like the current thing. And it was hard to put music out. And even if you did, people weren't really listening to it. You weren't doing release parties, just kind of a mess. And, uh, and that kind of attitude, um, it's, it's not clear how to find a way out of that, I don't think. Yeah. Well, James, you mentioned the AI stuff there. That's going to affect not just the creative industries, but it's going to change everything. It's not. It's going to affect blue collar, white white collar jobs massively. I interviewed Neil Ferguson, the historian, re recently. He 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 wrote about it and saying that we should pay attention to the to the likes of Alexia. Uh, what's his name? Um, Eliza uh, Rudkowski. Rudkowski. Big Yud, as he's known. Yeah, in, uh, and, and in our the, circles. you know, his doomsday. Uh, thinks that the that the end of the world is is upon us because of because of AI but and, and I don't I'm not sure I understand it and I'm fully convinced uh, either way but certainly when it comes to how it's going to affect jobs not just in the creative industry across the world from even a uh, esteemed historian like Neil if if the AI can read and assimilate information in the, the snap of a finger which takes you know would take any human years to do uh, history books are are going to be rewritten, <laughs> um, and yeah. uh, uh, it's it's something that everyone should. Pay. I don't know who's free of it. I mean, the artist. There's one amazing thing that Neil, Nick Cave, the singer, um, said when asked about AI, is that AI can't suffer, and I think that that's for, from the point of view of the artist, and and that would probably apply to the writers in Hollywood. Is is that that's that crucial difference. Um, is where great art comes from. So maybe those art, those writers and artists should perhaps tap into that or, or remember that. Yeah, I like that. That's very good. Um, it's good that you bring it up. I mean, certainly Nick Cave has had, had his share of suffering and he knows as yeah. well as anyone how personal and relational suffering can be. It's not just something that you experience in isolation. It's something that you experience, you know, this is sort of the price of admission for being human. Um, I'm not an AI doomer, as they as they call them. Um, you don't think it's the end of the world? No, I don't think it's the end of the world. Uh, I think you know the world as we knew it has already come to an end uh, in some important respects. Uh, but which respects? Well, as in, um, 
you know, look, the, the, the pretenses of modernity are being disintegrated by the triumph of technology over the world. Um, the view of, you know, just sort of peak America, if, if you believe in, in that sort of thing, where it's like uh, very optimistic, all about growth, all about, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to make the world American and then the world is going to be united and happy and flourishing. And uh, what we've discovered is that actually, no, like that's not, that's not what's happening. Uh, and people trying to understand like, well, if that's dead, then like where, where are we headed? Mm. Um, and to me, you know, what, what worries me, I think what the concern is, is not that the machines are going to independently sort of like take control over our world, uh, but that, you know, people in fact don't want to suffer. They don't want to be human. Uh, they, you know, we've, we've been nursing these grudges against, you know, well, if we can't make earth into a paradise, then, you know, fuck our humanity. You know, like mm -hmm. we want to imitate these machines. We want to imitate the internet. I, you got kids on the internet identifying as members of a swarm, you know, rather than as distinct individuals. And a lot of this stuff goes back thousands of years, actually, and it's just being unearthed in a new way by this technology. Um, you know, envy, envy toward, toward the angels, you know, envy toward the animals, um, a desire to somehow escape or, or transcend our humanity. Um, these are powerful forces, they're spiritual forces, uh, and they're being brought to the fore uh, by these kinds of challenges that technology is presenting. So I'm much more worried about, about the people than I am about the machines, but, you know, I also think that uh, trying to escape or, or transform our humanity is a fool's errand. We've, we've tried to do that. Before in the past too, it always ends in tears. It always ends in, in mass murder, uh, and so you know we got to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, what do if you mean we have the right kind of murder? sorry, you, are you what are you referring to there? Sorry. Oh, you know, war, genocide, oh. uh, uh, whether it's religious conflict or sort of anti-religious conflict. I mean, human beings are um, are apt to. Uh, behave in horribly self-destructive ways. Um, and I understand that for, uh, for many people today, that's a sort of like, see, that's why humanity sucks. You know, one of those ex-Google guys has been going around on book tour saying, we're building a God, humanity sucks. You know, it's, it would be great to basically be done with the human race because we tried it, it didn't work. Um, I don't think that's gonna work either. So uh, if we don't bring the right kind of sort of spiritual attitudes to the question of why are we building what we build? Why are we, why are we pushing technology in this way versus that way? Uh, then yeah, we're going to push a lot of people in a direction where they say like, you know what, just like put, put the chip in my head, take the pain away, um, I'm ready for the end, climb into the, the suicide pod or whatever. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and, and trying to, to terrify everyone into thinking that the machines are gonna kill us all you know, for someone like Elon Musk, uh, it's very convenient to say, like, AI is a terrible danger. That's why you need to put the chip in your head. Like, I don't know. You know, they're, they're always dangerous. Technology is always going to bring risks of it. Uh, but the, the ultimate risk is the one of sacrificing our own humanity in an effort to become something else. So what do you think is the spiritual... Uh, if you, you're, you're framing this as, as spiritual centers, and, and this, it seems almost like a, a f you're, a, you're pointing towards a philosophical issues at the root of this stuff. What do you think, I mean, it's, that was a pretty pessimistic uh, uh, statement that you made there. What, what, what if, if, you're attempted to, if you're attempted to be optimistic for a moment, what do you think is a way, a, a way out? How, what needs to be changed? What needs to be fixed? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the good news is the gospel. It's the message of Christ. You know, we are, um, we do have creative faculties as human beings, part of our our complement, uh, but we are not our own creatures. We do not own ourselves. Um, we are uh, we are living beings with spirit breathed into us, and we owe our lives and everything around us to our Creator. Every second of every day is a miracle. Um, and you know the thing that's holding everything together is not like the laws of physics or whatever. It is the grace of God. Um, and I think that you know starting from there allows us to understand our humanity and our technology and the relationship between the two in a totally different way from what's dominating right now. Yeah. Whether it's people who say AI is gonna save us or AI is gonna destroy us. Also, if you'd look at the, one of the things I've been thinking about a little bit now is, uh, for a while is transhumanism and posthumanism. Mm -hmm. But if you take posthumanism for a second, it's, it's, it's those um, 
utilitarians or uh, who, who or they're, they're, a, they're atheists, rational atheist movements. So they don't believe in a God, but they try to build a moral structure up from that. And the post-human is, is really significantly different uh, philosophy to Christian philosophy. It, they extend their, their graces to all sentient beings. So where Christians can make the easy distinction between humans and other species, animals, fruit, uh, whereas the post-human, they don't. And then they're also, they're hedging against well, how can we help the most humans, even those potential humans in the future? Again, these are issues that Christians can go there, but it was quite easy distinctions in, in how we understand the world. And, and these new philosophies that, that are coming in, I actually think the post-humanism will be the next great culture war. But maybe it might be 10, 20 years away. But I think that, that those nihilists or the, those... Uh, atheists rather will take two routes one is the which is the more consistent route if you don't believe in God which is nihilism and uh, that's a uh, you know it's a it's a sad and, and one-way road to hell but at least it's a consistent worldview the the post-human uh, route which I don't think is consistent but they they create their own metaphysic based on trying to be as good as they can to as many people and I think that that also ends very badly. So that's that's how I see things shaping up at the moment. Yeah, I think that's quite right. I mean, it's it's quite a thing to see self-described rationalists say like, okay, well, uh, you know, a human being is really just uh, a mind, and the mind is really just a brain, and the brain is really just a cortex, and mm. the cortex is really just a cluster of neurons, and mm. the cluster of neurons is really just sort of like a series of electric signals sort of moving around and bouncing yeah. off each other. And so therefore the rational thing to do is to conclude that we are really nothing but sort of zaps sort of happening, and that this is consciousness, and so the only thing that really matters about us is consciousness, because mm -hmm. we're the only thing that has that kind of like bundle of, of electric zaps. Well, actually, there's one other thing, and that's these machines that we're building. Mm -hmm. So we need to put those two things together and see the universe with it, and then we'll have consciousness, the light of consciousness. Well, that, will they, be can't everywhere. they can't even they define, define what it is. Well, they can't discern from the robots. That it's, a, it's an actual moral quandary for the rational atheist, post-human movement, if a robot and if you if you take the Turing test, it, it seems like it, it's as good as a robot. Then they can't. They have to give the robot human rights. Yeah. Well, they have to give them equal rights to humans. What kind of mess is that? But again, Christians Christians don't have that problem. It's a very easy distinction to make. That's right. Well, the Turing test all by itself is like, why would you want the test of how what actions we should take be based on whether or not we can trick ourselves? You know, mm. like mm. the test is like, well, if if a human tends to be confused by this illusion then that's sort of the measure of whether or not we should treat something like a human. This is insanity, right? Mm -hmm. This is totally sort of backwards. Yeah. Judging our, choosing our future based on what is the most effective form of deception. Yeah. I, I mean, back in the present, and this is, this is one of the great issues as well, is that there's all these pseudo religions trying to fill the gap that they, you know, they kill God. We've, we've seen this time and time again, and you alluded to it earlier. And if these new religions, uh, whether it's it's uh, environmentalism, uh, uh, hysteria around that, whether it's uh, trans and the woke stuff, these are new religions with new concepts of the soul and new and new gods, and they and that's because all of us who are acting in the world need a moral structure, and so to build a moral structure, we need some sort of met metaphysic and myth to ground it in, and so. Given that we reject, we have rejected Christianity. In my country now, we are minority a Christian country. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, there's these new religions filling filling the gap, and and that's then post-humanism is just is going to be the next one around the corner. It's, yeah, it's I think you're right. And so you look at the UK, so post-Christian, uh, no constitution. So you know maybe we're headed in a post-constitutional direction. You guys, no written constitution. Sorry, no written constitution. Um, you look at what, what the British have done with the pandemic, you look at what they're doing with you know, fighting disinformation and naughty, naughty words, uh, retroactively editing away, uh, whether it's Roald Dahl or Agatha Christie, there's sort of Penguin UK, I guess, just sort of going through their list and you know, editing things out. Um, are you, where do you think the UK is gonna be in five years? Is it gonna be recognizable? Huh, that, that's a big question. Um, and there's a few things you threw out there. Well, uh, first of all, I'd say when it comes to the censorship stuff and the tech collusion, it's the, it was the same story here in America. 
the, the same things that were revealed by the Twitter files journalists about government collusion, not just intelligence, but big government. Um, uh, uh, you could see it with the, the, the emails revealed that they were literally paying Twitter to uh, silence certain things. Even from, I just interviewed Lee Fang, who's one of the Twitter files yeah, journalists, and right. he was explaining how he discovered that even big pharma groups were lobbying uh, social media to censor certain uh, opinions that went against the vaccine uh, ma policy or mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the same thing was happening in Britain. Our health secretary, man, ha Matt Hancock, uh, as early as January, he was talking to um, social media about uh, changing the algorithm. This is something that Isabel Oakshot revealed, uh, fixing the al algorithm. And then he later, uh, it was revealed that he wanted to scare the pants off the British public in order to, um, uh, enforce his uh, lockdowns and the the damage of the lockdowns. I mean, it's just so clear. Like what we've done to that generation of kids, to all of us, it was just pure insanity on every, and it ruined the economy. Now, I think hopefully there will be some reckoning for that, and, and I think there's a different reckoning that needs to happen here in in America, and, and particularly now. Michael Schellenberger rev uh, re broke the, the story, and now we know. That patients zero, the three first patients are, are, are from COVID, were in the Wuhan um, Institute of Virology. What a coincidence. Yeah, and we know that they were doing gain-of-function research, mm -hmm. and we know that Fauci was paying for that research. The Wall Street Journal have confirmed this story. Uh, and gain-of-function, of course, illegal in the States. And so it, it seems, it appears like Fauci's move to censor all dissenting voices was actually to cover up the fact that he had started this bloody mess in the first place. Ah, we don't, I can't, that's conjecture, of course, but... But good conjecture. Yeah. See, I, I don't know, uh, all, I can't put all my time into this, although definitely, you know, deserves more time than, than, than any of us have in, in a certain sense. But I'm trying to find out why it is that EcoHealth Alliance, an organization that gets most of its money from uh, DOD and I think USAID, uh, and they just get, their contract was renewed, why this organization is run by a Brit, Peter Daszak. What's going on? Not even an American citizen. You know, and oh, a special relationship, so it's fine. But, you know, questions. Why, why him? Do, do we know? Well, why is that a problem? Well, it's not a problem necessarily, but it's very odd, I think, that you have someone who is so closely involved to the point of running the organization that was the go-between between the Chinese and the U.S. and, and the U.K. on, on the virology stuff. Um, would you rather it was a, uh, a CCP agent? Well, I, this, that would probably be worse, but it seems to just be unexplained. And I'm curious about what the British role was in how all of this unfolded, because it does seem like there's even more of a sort of a, 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 a party of globalization, technologization, of, of, uh, of governance through biotech in the UK than there is in the US. Yeah, well, it's very unclear. I mean, as well, this is something Jay Bhattacharya, who's a Stanford professor, has talked about, is that they had, a, he's an epidemi epidemiologist, they had a plan for such an occurrence. For, they've had a plan for 20 years of what to do, and they completely threw that out the window. And and it's easy to get conspiratorial, and I'll, I'll try and avoid it, but then you hear some of the stuff that the WEF talk about, and, and, and I know, uh, your colleague Glenn Beck speaks a, a lot about them, and and they should be held to account. And and we see some of the movements of the WHO. It, it there's there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of cloud around that, and and um, some of the some of the actions just they defy logic. And and it might be a while before we get to the bottom of it, but um, but we need to all attention needs to go on that because. It's, it's an, a total tragedy. Uh, 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 the amount of unnecessary lives cost and lives ruined by that. The world's poor have got poorer. It's ju it was just a catastrophe. A, a self, it was self-harm. It wasn't something that, that happened. It was the policy that was the problem. And, and that, 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 that I, I'm, you know, it's even a little bit upset thinking about it. And, and back to the kind of future of my country. Sure. And perhaps this is, uh, 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 would be, but, you know, be positive. But you talk about you mentioned uh, Roald Dahl and and some of the um, kind of overarching progressive stuff. I think that there are slowly being movements on the free speech side. Our our, uh, our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has appointed a free speech czar called um, uh, Arif Ahmed. 
uh, who really is great on free speech. Um, there's a real pushback against uh, the um, uh, trans ideology, uh, and um, uh, the, the, they've gone way too far butchering our kids with our own money, our taxpayers' money, and that's the, the, the Tavistock Clinic's been uh, told to close down. There's real movement in, in a positive dir direction, I think, to combat some of the hysteria that went wild. Uh, and, and we can sort of understand, it's all tied in with the COVID stuff. We were all at home, you know, glued to our phones, going a little bit nuts. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all part of the same very complex um, mess that, we, that we've been uh, going through. Uh, with a lot of new technologies we don't fully understand. And, but I do think that in some ways, Britain is moving in, in, in the right direction. And so um, I hope uh, you, you, you can be seen as a, 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 a good example of, of, or a good future if, if America goes maybe in a similar way. What's going on over here? What's the... Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's a, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a cold civil war. It's a digital civil war. Uh, it's not street fighting. Um, although that that seems to be part of it at a at a smaller scale. I mean, obviously France is going through something nightmarish right now. Mm. Uh, is, is this kind of civil unrest, you know, it's it's everywhere. And uh, and in the U.S., it's mostly done by inter internet. You know, you you can just log on every day, and uh, and yell at people and seek and destroy people and uh, target and track and and all the rest. Um, sometimes, you know, in a way that's ultimately state sponsored. Uh, we've got you know more NGOs than we can keep track of. Uh, we've got an intelligence community that's totally. Uh, undisciplined, out of control, um, n un held unaccountable, um, a Congress that's delegated away all of its uh, uh, authority to the administrative state of the regulatory agencies. Uh, it's really bad. And, uh, you know, you look at the SEC and you got a guy who uh, some of the, the more naive crypto people were like, oh, he, he knows about Bitcoin. He even taught some classes. He's going to be, you know, one of us. And he's, no, he's not, mm. not one of us. Uh, so the scene is bad. Um, the scene is bad. And I think there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of dismay over what's happened to the Anglosphere, you know, US, UK, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Uh, you know, these are the five eyes. This is yeah. supposed to be the, the best darn yeah. security apparatus in, in world history. And uh, well, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's it's all started as to protect us for our good. You know, you mentioned the five eyes and it's all started the Patriot Act out, out of 9 11. These, uh, the idea, and we had this with Prevent in the UK. Mm -hmm. Uh, organizations and policy to protect our own citizens against uh, it was Islamists at, at the time and and those and we saw and, and then Snowden revealed uh, uh, that, that that turned into stellar wind and the same things happened again where 2016 it was uh, after ISIS and uh, th those policies and and then there was this sort of Russian uh, inf uh, 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 this is what Hamilton 68, exp this is something Taibi exposed mm -hmm. in Twitter files, mm -hmm. that the, the Russia disinformation was a hoax, but all of that was used to try and turn, uh, originally framed and phrased as if to protect the people of America and people of Britain, then they turned to surveil us and to censor us. Here's something that I'm very concerned about, which I come to your great, I love America. I'm a big fan of America, but I've been, really concerned about censorship in your country and mine. We've yep. talked a little bit about that. And I read yesterday one of these, uh, there's an NGO called GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D, mm -hmm. Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And yesterday they had published a letter signed by hundreds of self-proclaimed um, uh, celebrities and um, uh, uh, what do they call themselves, uh, influencers, and including uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, Jamila Jamil, um, uh, and, uh, well, uh, and other artists, uh, Dylan Mulvaney, uh, actually Dylan Mulvaney, uh, this isn't an artist, maybe a con artist, but, uh, but uh, the, all of these people um, who are, they want, they've written a letter to, letter to the likes of Zuckerberg, Musk and the social mm -hmm. media um, heads saying, we want censorship, we want censorship, um, people who dead name and misgender, because that's apparently very hurtful and harmful, uh, we also want censorship of uh, disinformation around uh, life-affirming uh, trans... I'll get the wording right, trans care for, for minors. Right, now, if you think about what that, that... 
what they're advocating for. Like they, they want, you know, era, this is, you know, sex change hormone, uh, sex, uh, different sex hormones f for kids and uh, 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 all, all this stuff they're doing, kids, it's irreversible. Puberty blockers, Puberty blockers. And this even before the surgeries. And exactly. yeah, there are going to be lawsuits, but it's not enough, and it's not fast enough. And, you know, it's, it's, this is bad enough as it is, and then you add to that what comes next. Yeah. And what comes next is any kind of, of biotechnological intervention into your child that yeah. the regime says that you got to do. But and if you don't do it, they take your kid away. My, here's my concern is that actually censorship is actually quite a popular uh, idea. Yeah. And the, the hundreds of these artists... Uh, and celebrities want censorship of, of these certain things. Imagine if, if criticizing lobotomy was censored. That, that's, that's a kind of how I see it. But yeah, way, they're, like, they're like blasphemy laws. Yeah, uh, and the, they, but I think, I, I think a good proportion of the population in your country mine are pro-censorship. Yeah. And, and so in your country, it's in the Bill of Rights, right? In the First Amendment. In my country, John Milton wrote Aeropagitica. I always mispronounce it, Aeropagitica. We had John Locke, John Stuart Mill, all writing the great tracks explaining free speech and how significant that was. Mm -hmm. You have it in your constitution. And yet, half, I think maybe as much as half the people are pro-censorship. Like, we, we have to explain again to a whole new generation why we need free speech. It's so that bad ideas don't run wild and go crazy and terrible things happen when you, do, when you have free speech. Yeah, well, I you mean, I agree with you, of course, and, and yet that's not always the argument that the free speech people try to give, like especially like some of the more sort of intellectual, you know, they say, well, look, you get, you get the smartest people together and you let them have free speech and then they talk and then they have sort of competing ideas and what happens is the best ideas emerge and then you get sort of like the very truest stuff. Truth only emerges from this kind of like discourse among the, the smartest people speaking freely. And, you know, I don't know, the track record on that's very bad. Track record yeah, on, to say the least. For, to say the least, track record on free speech is being like, hey, this is a good way at like breaking up really bad ideas and preventing really bad things from sort of like eating um, not just the public square, but the public square in your mind, you know, yeah, attacking your wrong. consciousness. Um, maybe you want to talk about this, maybe you don't. Uh, we got a little bit of time. Uh, I would be remiss not to say you, of course, you know, suffered greatly from, uh, from daring to s express yourself on a tweet that was, that was disliked by, by the censoring mob. Um, just walk us through a little bit um, how, how that was, um, how you felt when you realized that you needed to like make the statement, how you felt about the statement. I mean, it's, it's, this is now sort of a rite of passage for so many people. Uh, well, I'm not sure I'd see it as a rite of passage, but um, uh, it was two years ago, and I'm happy to say that for all of the hell of that, that period, uh, life is, you know, God has guided me, and life, I rebuilt a, a good life that I find very meaningful and... Um, uh, doing work that I find very challenging and, and stimulating. So, so it's I, I've 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 worked as hard as I can at every opportunity since then. And I, and I and I say that because I've said this story so many times. And I think when I initially told the story, I was you know it was a raw time and it was very emotional. I feel like I'm past that. But yes, two years ago, I I I tweeted. I was tweeting through the pandemic about books I'd I'd been reading, and one of those books was by American journalist Andy No documenting the BLM uh, protests of 2000 and the Antifa movement and it it blew up and it went up all the trending in uh, uh, charts in my country and yours it ended up being a segment on Tucker and the View by the end of the weekend um, and it's quite I interviewed Lee Fang I think I mentioned this and, and a similar thing happened to him during, during the... He was working at The Intercept, which is a left-wing media group. Um, and during, the pande during the, those um, uh, uh, protests, he, he published an interview with a BLM protester called Max. And this is only a couple of days after June 2nd, I think. And he, the, the protester was pro-BLM. And all he just, he just wanted to say... But I have some criticisms, and one of those criticisms is that I have two cousins that were killed. They were killed by other blacks. Why did no one care then? You only seem to care when it's white people killing black people. And it was a criticism. Lee Fang was then forced to apologize 
by The Intercept, and uh, and that's crazy. He's a journalist. Journalists are just... He wasn't an op-ed he was uh, uh, apologising for. It wasn't um, uh, misinformation or malinformation. Or, oh, actually, it probably was technically malinformation. True stuff that is against the narrative. Um, and uh, the idea that a journalist should apologise for publishing an interview with someone it, it, it's just bizarre to me, but that's the climate that it was in, in, in 2000. It's a very, just a bizarre year. Um, and anyway, so I published this tweet about, uh, about this book, All Hell Broke Loose. I wanted to protect uh, the, all these Antifa activists and uh, the like were coming after me, my loved ones, uh, the people I worked with. I wanted to protect them. They were very upset about it, so I issued an apology. And then in the coming months, that apology really weighed on me because I, I was wrong to... I was wrong to apologise because I hadn't actually done anything wrong. The more I looked into it, it's like, yeah, actually, it's not good that 19 people were killed in the first 14 days of the BLM riots. It's not the, these little uh, Antifa thugs that are running around uh, looting and destroying businesses, many of which were black businesses, uh, and, you know, in a, in a year where we're supposed to be showing solidarity with our black brothers and sisters, it, it, it was... I was wrong to apologise, because those things should be criticised. Um, but I knew that in saying what I really thought... I mean, I could have stayed in the band and lied and, uh, you know, nodded along with the kind of uh, music industry narrative. Um, it's a very progressive industry. I was uh, going to say, how much pressure was on the band to just not participate? Or, or to signal the right kind of signal? Well, uh, a, a tremendous amount of pressure was on, on the band. Radio stations said they, wouldn't go, they weren't going to play us. I was one festival I was due to DJ, and they dropped me without, they, without even, you know, reaching out to me. Um, and a lot of other artists, like, dogpiled. Uh, I remember, I, I haven't sort of... I won't name them, but I, artists that I've toured with and worked with, I was like, oh, wow, you're, like, you're part of this. Um, it was it was a very difficult time and difficult for the band, and um, I didn't want them to suffer the consequences of my opinions. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to... Uh, you know, what kind of an artist doesn't stick by his convic convictions? It's our responsibility to pursue the truth. That apology that I was forced to sign, it hung around my neck like a, a tablet of shame. And it, it was, oh, what kind of father apologises when he's done it? Like, I was thinking about, like, well, if I have a family, like, am I really an example to my kid? No. It was, it was it's kind of humiliating in the end. So I was like, the only way forward is for me to retract that, explain why, quit the band so that those guys can do what they need to do. And my sort of philosophy philosophy has been tell the truth and play the chips as they lie and I had always wanted to be a rock star I think a lot of kids did and I had thought that we were going to do this I thought I was going to do it till I was an old man and God has a different plan for me and uh, and, and I do see it that way actually uh, and and as I said it's amazing the journey I, I've been on it's been the ride of a ride of a lifetime well, you, you look good. You, you're, you're speaking sense. You seem, you seem decidedly sane, despite all of the, the insanity. Um, what's, what's next? What are you, what are you most, uh, most uh, uh, consumed with right now? Uh, well, the pod I've been really enjoying. I just had uh, uh, Sh Michael Schellenberger on, mm -hmm. explaining the uh, censorship industrial complex, and Lee Fang is also one of the Twitter files. Uh, I've got coming up next, I have interviewed Francis Fukuyama, who, who was the great... A uh, political philosopher who told us that the end of history was after the fall of the Soviet Union, and I challenged him because I don't think that's the case, particularly as the world is voting against liberal democracy yeah. or certainly against liberalism uh, in their masses. Did you get him to talk about the book which uh, he, he refuses to talk about anymore? Our, our post human future. Oh, he did wrote he write it that? down? Yes. No way. And now know. he pretends as if it never happened. Huh. Scandalous. Oh, I wish I had. Scandalous. Anyway, I do. Well, you need to bring him on your show then. Yeah, that's Sounds right. like you've got some uh, questions for him. <laughs> <laughs> certainly do. Um, so, yeah, the, the pod, I'm uh, making music still and um, various ventures. Hopefully, I'll 
come back to your show because I've just launched a cigar business in Britain where we're importing foundation cigars, oh, which is the great American cigar, if I can say so. Please, I think it's one do. of your great... You're in cigar um, country right now. Yeah, well, I know that. I, I, I struggle to hang as, as an Angelino. It's just, you know, I, I see people smoke, chain smoke cigars out here. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, no, well, uh, actually, I went down, what was it called? It's called like the Blue Smoke Lounge or something, downtown Dallas, as soon as I arrived and picked out a couple of sticks and I sat down with those three guys in, in, in the room and I don't think they knew each other, but they were all chatting and I sat down and, and, and burnt stick with them and we just talked about the difference between soccer and American sport, British sport. And, and it's, this is, I used to do this when we were touring. I would, I would go into local lounges and uh, local cigar lounges and just smoke. And I love it in America because cigars is not an elite thing. I mean, sure, the elites smoke it, but actually it's an every person it's a great yeah. equalizer. It's, you it's have like all wine. walks of everyone, life come everyone in and they it. chat, and it's yeah. just, it's a, it's a great thing. Uh, so anyway, cigars. So come back, talk <laughs> about cigars. We'll put a humidor right here on the edge of the desk. There we go. Um, this creepy question, but, but everyone asks it. Where can people find you? <laughs> where can we find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter, Mr. Wynn Marshall. I'm on Substack, the Wynn Stack, where you get some of my writing. I'm on Instagram, Winston Marshall, and all the social media, you'll, you'll find me out there. I'm online. He's out there, baby. That's all the time we've got, at least until next time. This is Zero Hour. I am James Tullis, and may God have mercy on us all. <laughs> <laughs>